medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Today we're going to go over the results of a trial that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Randomized Trial of Metformin, Ivermectin, and Fluvoxamine for COVID-19. This study looked at quite a bit of data comparing in the outpatient setting the use of metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine for the prevention of hospitalization and hypoxemia in patients that were diagnosed. This actually looked at subjects over a long period of time. This started actually back in December of 2020 and closed in February of 2022. And it was funded by an interesting organization an organization known as the Parsimus Foundation. Now, the Parsimus Foundation says here on their website, works to create meaningful improvements in human and animal health and welfare by advancing innovative and neglected medical research. And it looks like they were started back in the 1990s. They were actually involved with male contraception. And they talk a little bit more about their mission. They say that the foundation works to create meaningful improvements in human and animal health and welfare by advancing innovative and neglected medical research. The foundation's focus is on supporting small proof of concept studies and then pursuing press coverage of the results so that the advance of change treatment practice rather than disappearing into the scientific literature. Many of the studies we support, they say here, involve low-cost approaches that are not under patent. So it looks as though this organization would really be interested in trying to make sure that our three drugs that were used in this trial, specifically metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine, seem to do the trick. And the way they designed the study was actually quite interesting. So this study was primarily done in the United States, and the entrance criteria was 30 to 85 years of age. All were overweight at least overweight, some had obesity. They had to have been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 positivity for no more than three days, and symptoms no more than seven days. The median, as it turns out, was more like four to five days, so it wasn't like it was seven days in this group, but it was actually less. And they actually recruited from 12-30-2020 all the way to 1-28-22. And so it went through alpha, it went through delta, and also omicron, and we'll show you that data. They actually recruited, because of a power analysis, 1,431 patients that underwent randomization, which was actually quite a bit. And the power of the study seemed to indicate that based on this number, they should be able to detect a 30 to 40 percent relative risk reduction in hospitalization and ER visits and low oxygen saturation defined as less than 93 percent. Those were the endpoints. Then what they did was something actually quite interesting. They came up with six different groups, each of which got two medications, or at least a medication and a placebo. Now remember what the three medications were that they were looking at. They were looking at metformin, And for this one, they actually titrated up the dose to a total of 1,500 milligrams a day times 14 days. The second medication was ivermectin, and the dose there was 390 to 470 micrograms per kilogram per day times three days. Then number three was fluvoxamine. And here, instead of the 100 milligram dose that was used in the TOGETHER trial, they went with 50 milligrams, presumably because it was better tolerated, as they state in the article, and that's twice a day, and they did that for 14 days. So interestingly, they did this sort of two by three way of approaching this. They had one group take a placebo mixed with a placebo, so two placebos, and then another group that got metformin and placebo, another one that got placebo and fluvoxamine, another group that got metformin and fluvoxamine, another one that got a placebo and ivermectin, and then finally one that got metformin and ivermectin. And so what's interesting about this is if you want to do analysis for metformin, all you would simply have to do is compare these two groups the placebo-placebo versus the metformin-placebo to see if there was any improvement. 
Similarly, you would then add that to this comparison, which is a metformin and fluvoxamine versus a placebo and fluvoxamine, because the difference there is still the metformin. And then you could also compare and add to this group, which is a placebo and ivermectin plus a metformin and ivermectin. You can see here again that the differences between these comparisons is that one group has a metformin and the other group has the placebo. How do you do analysis, therefore, of ivermectin? The way you would do it for ivermectin is by looking at these two groups and these two groups. So again, what you're doing here is you're doing the placebo ivermectin versus the placebo placebo and adding that to the ivermectin metformin versus the placebo metformin. And that's exactly how they made that comparison as well. And then for the fluvoxamine, the way that they would make that comparison, as you can probably guess, is they would look at these two groups. Because again here, you have fluvoxamine versus placebo and placebo versus placebo. And here you have fluvoxamine versus placebo and metformin is going to cancel out metformin. So actually a very interesting study design. Now, in terms of the primary endpoint, as it states here in the article, the primary endpoint was severe COVID-19 through 14 days, defined as a composite of hypoxemia, less than 93% oxygen saturation on home oximetry, emergency department visit, hospitalization, or death. At the time that the investigational new drug application was obtained for all of the trial drugs, primary endpoints were typically assessed at 14 days in COVID-19 treatment trials. So let's take a look at the randomization. We can see here metformin in the active and control groups, ivermectin in respective groups, and fluvoxamine in active and control groups. And you can see here that there's a fairly good distribution in terms of the median age being in approximately the 40-year-old age group. There's a slight plurality of female sex in all of the groups. Most of the subjects across the board here were white. And you can also see here that the body mass index across the board was, in terms of median, at 30, which clearly is, if not overweight, obese. Notice that in terms of primary series of vaccines, the percentage was just over 50% across the board in most of these groups. And if we can look here at the predominant variant, we'll see here that across the board, upwards of 60% was from June of 2021 to December of 2021 during the Delta surge, with also quite a bit of Omicron involvement in terms of recruitment during that study. And it was during this time that vaccinations seemed to decline in terms of benefits of preventing infection but still holding up in terms of preventing the worst outcomes in COVID-19, such as severe COVID-19 hospitalization and death. Now, in terms of the endpoint at 14 days, notice that the primary outcome was a composite of hypoxemia reported by the patients, emergency department visits, hospitalization, or death due to COVID-19. Now, you should know that the oxygenation was reported by the patients, and so that's open to interpretation if they would remember that. There's also the reporting of emergency room visits, which you would hope they would remember more. And then there's hospitalization, which can actually be verified objectively, as well, of course, as death due to COVID-19. The numbers should be pretty tight on hospitalization and death, and maybe a little bit more wiggly, if you will, on oxygen saturation. Nevertheless, if we looked at that primary composite endpoint for 14 days, what you can see here is the 95% confidence intervals for metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine. And the first thing you'll notice is that you'll get a number and a p-value. And the reason why the p-value is not less than 0.05 is because it's not statistically significant. Or another way of putting it is that the 95% confidence interval includes unity or the number one, which means that there was no statistical significance between the medication and its control group. We can see here that the 95% confidence interval was a little bit tighter on metformin, and it looks like it was on its way to getting below 1.0, but at least at the amount of patients that were enrolled explicitly for adjusted odds ratio for primary composite endpoints at 14 days, it did not meet statistical significance. Ivermectin actually was above, on average, 1.05, and it had a very wide confidence interval. And then fluvoxamine, 
also very similarly had a wide interval as well. And again, fluvoxamine was the one medication out of the TOGETHER trial that actually seemed to make some improvement. However, that was at the 100 milligram dose twice daily. Again, remember, this was at the 50 milligram twice daily dose. Now, interestingly, if we just look at the more objective information of emergency department visit, hospitalization, or death, we start to see some interesting findings here of statistical significance. Metformin now is able to reach statistical significance in terms of its confidence interval at 0.58 for the average. Ivermectin actually rises up even further at 1.39 and fluvoxamine also rises up above unity at 1.17, meaning that metformin of these three with this secondary endpoint of adjusted odds ratio for emergency department visits, hospitalization, and death actually seems to show some possible benefit, at least in obese patients. And it's interesting because of the limitations that are included here in the summary. They say that the findings are limited by the following. Number one, only patients with overweight or obesity were enrolled, and very few of them were black or Latinx. Metformin showed a potential benefit in relation to more severe components of the primary endpoint in the pre-specified secondary analysis, but because it was pre-specified, the findings were not definitive and further study is needed. And then finally, other studies showed a benefit with fluvoxamine in COVID-19 in higher doses. So the overall conclusions were that metformin, ivermectin, and fluvoxamine did not prevent severe COVID-19 outcomes in non-hospitalized patients with overweight or obesity. So the question is, is why did the authors of this study pick the dosage of these medications that they had picked? Well, first of all, let's talk about metformin. They say here that metformin has also shown anti-inflammatory actions including reducing levels of interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6, and decreasing the risk of thrombosis and inflammasome activation. The drug has also shown protection against lipopolysaccharide-induced lung injury in mice inoculated with SARS-CoV-2. Observational studies have shown associations between the use of metformin and less severe COVID-19 in patients who are already receiving metformin. They had reason to believe it, and they wanted to push the dose, and that's why they picked 1,500 milligrams a day. So how did they come up with the ivermectin dose? They said here that ivermectin has shown in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2, but at levels that were 50 to 100 times as high as those that are achievable in humans. In small randomized trials involving 398 volunteers, investigators assessed the use of ivermectin at a dose of 300 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day for five days and found no effect on system resolution. Although the study population was young and had few coexisting illnesses, the ongoing use of ivermectin, possibly because of concern that the evaluated dose was too low, has suggested the need for more data. And so I think that is the reason why they increased the dose from 300 micrograms per kilogram up to even as high as 470 micrograms per kilogram. But instead of giving it for five days as they had done before, they opted for just three days in this case. And then finally, they talk about fluvoxamine. And remember with fluvoxamine at 100 milligrams twice a daily, like in the TOGETHER trial, there was a statistical significant reduction in hospitalization at about 30%. Now here they say that fluvoxamine has anti-inflammatory actions that are mediated by the sigma-1 receptor, and we've talked about that before. And the same biophysical model predicted that fluvoxamine would perturb sigma-1 receptor-mediated virin assembly as viral products transfer from the cytoplasm to the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, there was two randomized trials of fluvoxamine at a dose of 100 milligrams two or three times per day, showing a reduction of approximately 25% in hospitalizations or prolonged acute care visits. However, starting fluvoxamine at 100 milligrams can cause side effects. In a non-randomized prospective cohort study, investigators found that fluvoxamine at a dose of 50 milligrams twice daily may be effective and had better side effect profile than the 100 milligram dose, which suggested a need to study this lower dose. And that's exactly what they did in this study. And of course, it didn't seem to work out. So in the discussion section, they talk about metformin starting at a dose of 1,500 milligrams daily without dose adjustment, just starting it off, which may have caused side effects and discontinuations. 
If you don't look at intention to treat, but rather in the per protocol analysis, hospitalizations occurred in eight of 168 patients, or at 4.8% in the metformin group, and in 14 of 179 patients at 7.8% in the control group. So what they're saying here is that if you stick with the program and actually take the 1,500 milligrams and tolerate it, it actually may improve hospitalization. I think they got pretty excited about that. They say a higher dose of metformin may not improve anti-inflammatory actions as suggested in a recent study of macular degeneration. Also, immediate release metformin may have higher peak systemic exposure than the extended release formulation, which may be relevant in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what they're saying here is that when you're starting off with treatment in someone with SARS-CoV-2, you don't want to take the time to get up to the level that you need to. You want to get it up right away. And so this extended release formulation may not be the best thing to use. Immediate release is maybe what you want to use. So they go on to talk about fluvoxamine. And again, they say here at the low dose of 50 milligrams, which they used in this study, twice daily prevented a primary endpoint in this population, they didn't find that. They did not find that fluvoxamine at that low dose prevented anything. They do mention that in two randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trials, investigators found that a higher dose at 100 milligrams two to three times daily resulted in a 25 to 30 percent reduction in hospitalization or a prolonged emergency department stay. And so they acknowledge that perhaps they may have underdosed in this, especially in patients who might have been, for instance, overweight or obese. Then they go on to talk about ivermectin. And we've talked about this issue before, where there are international trials where they have tested ivermectin, particularly in countries that have high parasitic infection rates with strong leoides. And if these patients are being placed on severe immunocompromising medications like dexamethasone or prednisone or steroids, ivermectin may actually have a benefit in that it is going to control and get rid of these parasitic infections, because actually that is what that medication does a very good job of doing. What they say here is is interesting uh, because it sort of goes down that pathway. They say, likewise, we did not find evidence that ivermectin prevented a primary event in this population of U.S. adults who were 30 years of age or older and who were overweight or had obesity. Because of previous randomized trial of ivermectin at a dose of 300 micrograms per kilogram per day did not show any significant effect, we chose a higher dose, a median of 430 micrograms per kilogram, with a range being from 390 to 470 micrograms per kilogram per day. Ivermectin has been studied around the world, and the effect of ivermectin would be expected to be greater in patients with chronic strongleoides sterocorallis. Now, again, this is a parasitic infection of a parasite, which is destroyed by ivermectin. And so what's keeping the strongleoides at bay is the immune system. That's why they have a chronic infection. But when they come down with severe COVID-19, or even sometimes COVID-19 causing hypoxemia, they might get put on dexamethasone. And what's that going to do? It's going to knock out the immune system and allow the strong leoides to take over. It's at that point that ivermectin may actually be very beneficial in keeping these people alive because it gets rid of this chronic infection that could threaten them. And that's exactly what they say here. They say that parasitic infections who had COVID-19 progression and received dexamethasone may have prevented life-threatening hyperinfection with strong leoides species. The key, though, is that in most of the places in the United States, strong leoides is really rare. They made the notable exception except in Appalachia. So is this study going to put the nail in the coffin of those who believe in ivermectin? I highly doubt it. If we look at the FLCCC, which is the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, one of the first medications that's listed in order of priority for early COVID treatment is ivermectin. We at MedCram have talked about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and zinc very early on. In fact, we were probably one of the first ones to mention these medications as potential therapies for COVID-19. In fact, Dr. Zelenko referenced our update 34 way back in early 2020 as the reason why he used hydroxychloroquine. Of course, we stated in our videos at that time that this in vitro research would have to be confirmed with randomized placebo control trials to know whether or not it actually worked, but we understood the idea of benefit to risk ratio at the time. There have been a number of studies that have looked at hydroxychloroquine in retrospective and observational studies. However, there's been some recent studies that have come out prospectively 
for instance, like the TOGETHER trial that looked at hydroxychloroquine and found that it did not work in their randomized placebo-controlled trial. Also, ivermectin did not work in the TOGETHER trial, but the fluvoxamine did at the 100 milligram twice daily dose. And here at the FLCCC website, they recommend 0.4 to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, which is still even a little bit higher than what was done here in this existing study. And of course, the important portion here is for at least five days or until symptoms resolve. So I think that's going to be the sticking point in terms of the study. But remember, again, this study was started in December of 2020 when perhaps they didn't have the benefit of knowing that people who were really proponents of ivermectin wanted to have this dose for this long. Looking over the protocol here, I do notice some things that we've talked about before. We've talked about the benefits of quercetin. We've talked about the benefits of zinc, vitamin C as well, and melatonin, although I think 10 milligrams may be a little bit excessive, especially if you want to try to get to sleep. I think higher doses of melatonin often don't do exactly what it is that you'd like them to do. I think vitamin D supplementation is a great idea. I do it myself. Aspirin is sort of a quandary for me. I understand why aspirin's on this list because we want to try to prevent platelet aggregation. Some of these studies that have come out showing that platelet aggregation may be causing some of the blood clots that we're seeing in COVID-19. So I think that that's a reasonable addition and I don't hold back on that. The only problem that I have with aspirin is its effect on the innate immune response of fever. And we've talked a lot about the role of fever in COVID-19 and the innate immune system and what fever will do to interferon secretion and why interferon secretion is so important. In fact, even getting the temperature up with things like hydrotherapy that we discussed very, very early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically updates 46 and 47. Also, this Nigella sativa is uh, very interesting. There's been some data that's come out of Egypt and Pakistan in a randomized placebo-controlled trial that actually shows some pretty interesting and positive results in treating COVID-19 from taking just supplementation with black cumin seed. I think certainly the benefits and the risks there are in favor of doing it until we hear more information. And I'd say that I'd also agree with note number one here. They state here, as global COVID-19 cases continue to rise, even in the most vaccinated populations, the need for effective prevention and early treatment has never been more critical. Vaccines have shown some efficacy in preventing the most severe outcomes of COVID-19. However, rising vaccine breakthrough infection rates do not support the rationale for mandates. And I agree. In my recent bout here in the last two years in the intensive care unit, specifically during the Delta surge, most, if not all, of the patients that we saw severely ill in the intensive care unit on ventilators were patients that were unfortunately not vaccinated. But unfortunately, as time has gone on and we've gone to Omicron, we are starting to see more and more people becoming infected, not necessarily hospitalized, but infected with COVID-19, despite vaccination status. In fact, despite previous infection status, there was a period of time before where people thought that once you had become infected with COVID-19, that you could never be infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus again and get COVID-19 again. And that clearly is incorrect. So overall, I think this was a good study, interesting study. I think it's going to lend a little bit more information to what's going on currently. I think the metformin angle is quite interesting. And I'm going to be a little bit more assured that if I do prescribe fluvoxamine for a patient, it's going to be at the 100 milligram dose. And I'd just like to say that I have no financial interest whatsoever in metformin, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, any of the vaccines for COVID-19, and uh, no pharmaceutical company has paid for this or any other video on medcram.com. I hope this has been helpful, and don't forget to join us at medcram.com for 60 plus hours of continuing medical education material. Also, join us there for our COVID-19 updates. If you want those commercial-free, simply sign up at medcram.com.